So I'll be talking about the paradox of uncertainty. So let's play a little game. Imagine um, we're playing, a, we are at a game show and there are three doors. Behind one of the doors is a car and behind two of the doors are goats. Now pick a door. Okay, let's assume you were to pick door number one. Uh, <laughs> let's assume you were to pick door number one. Let me give you a little bit of a hand. There's a goat behind door number three. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want to stick with the original choice of door number one, or, uh, or do you want to switch to door number two? Okay, uh, statistically, most of you will actually stick. So most of you will actually stay with door number one. Unfortunately, you will have a lower chance of winning the car. In this case, it was actually a Ferrari, I'm sorry. So uh, you will have a lower chance of winning the car if you were to have sticked uh, compared to if you, have, if you were to have switched. Now, let me explain this to you. So if you were to assume uh, that your initial chance of winning the car by, uh, by choosing door number one was one in three. It's fairly reasonable to, to say this. And the chances of the car being in either door two or three, behind door two or three, is two in three. Now, by me showing you that there's actually a goat behind door number three, all the probability of doors two and three are being compounded into just door number two. So you, you would have had a higher chance of winning uh, the car if you had actually switched. Now, what we're essentially trying to do uh, in, in, in these sort of scenarios is try to reason uh, in situations where it's, it's difficult to reason with certainty. So, uh, con so if you were to actually t take this, uh, this same example of, uh, of cars and goats and, and take it to the extreme, if you were to consider the case where there are actually only two doors, so there's, uh, behind one of the two doors is a car and behind what, the, the other door is a goat. Now, uh, knowledge of the, of the second selection does not affect the, uh, the first in a physical sense, but obviously it allows us, uh, it, it enables us to infer better what is actually behind door number one. So, for example, if on the second selection we know that we have a goat, then obviously behind door number one uh, is a car and vice versa. Thus, conditional probabilities represent logical connections rather than causal ones. Now this, uh, as it, uh, as it uh, happens, is uh, not a problem of substance, but of concept. So to sum, a probability represented a degree of belief or, pro or plausibility uh, is, is how, how likely something was, uh, was to happen uh, given, uh, how likely something was to happen uh, given the, the data to hand. Unfortunately to others, such as 19th century uh, uh, scholars, uh, this was too vague uh, and subjective an idea uh, to be the basis of a rigorous mathematical theory. So they defined probability to be the relative long-run frequency of an event occurring given many repeated trials. Now, uh, as frequencies can be measured, uh, probability was seen as an objective tool for dealing with random phenomena. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, frequentist theory it merely gives a, a, a guise, it merely gives this illusion of being an objective theory, which we've seen in this simple scenario uh, to obviously not be the case. Now, such uh, ideas of actually thinking uh, about uh, and reasoning with uh, uncertainty was originally posited uh, by uh, an Englishman, uh, Reverend Thomas Bayes. Now, what he was interested in doing was, uh, was actually reasoning and inferring um, uh, cause and effect. Now, what he did was he, he, he placed an, um, he wanted to predict a future event and he did this based on how, how many times he had uh, observed it either occurring or not occurring in the past. So he was then able to uh, posit an initial belief, and then he was taking in some new data, a new piece of observation, a new observation, and then improving his belief as he was going along. So if we were to formulate this, we would say, we would say that we, we had a, a prior belief, and then we, um, we take in a new piece of information and we formulate that into our likelihood of this actually occurring, and then we have an improved belief. Let's see a, a simple uh, scenario of this. So imagine Inspector Clouseau has just turned up at the, at the scene of a murder and uh, he sees a body alongside a possible murder weapon. Now, his, his two main suspects are the butler and the maid. Now, prior to actually you know, coming here, he has a prior belief that the butler committed the murder at, at point six. And he has a prior belief that the maid committed the murder, murder at point two. So now, given that we know, so it, it was a possibility, but now that we know that the knife was the murder weapon, how, uh, how likely is it that the butler actually committed the murder? 
So if we were to go through uh, the, um, the probabilities, if we were to crunch through the numbers, so initially our, our uh, prior belief of the butler actually committing the murder was 0.6. But now knowing, so taking in this new piece of information that the knife was used, so uh, from this we can actually uh, strengthen our belief that the butler actually committed the murder. So, so a priori he was 0.6 and now our posterior belief that he is 0.73. So obviously we've strengthened our belief that he's actually committed the murder. Now back to the case at hand. I'm a financier. Let's go to Monte Carlo. Here's Monaco, Monte Carlo over there. Now, um, there was a, a romantic couple. Let's go on a little, uh, little journey with us, well, with them, actually. Um, so the romantic couple, uh, a boy and a girl, and uh, they're romantic hill climbers. They went out on a date one, one evening, and uh, they climbed a hill, you know, as they do, the romantic hill climbers. Uh, they get to the top of the hill, and uh, the boy, they, they both see a pool. The boy turns to the girl and goes, I can tell you the size of that pool. And the girl turns to him, no, you can't. And he's like, yes, I can. How, how I will do it is I will take small pebbles and I will throw the pebbles at the pool and depending on how many fall in compared to how many fall out, I can estimate the size of the pool. Now, if you were to take this uh, simple uh, analysis uh, of Monte Carlo sampling and then if you were to try to estimate, for example, pi and represent this uh, with a circle, uh, with a square, and then if you were to bound this and start throwing in samples, as you can see, if you were to continuously do this, uh, we would end up with... Uh, an estimate for pi. Now, coming back to uh, probabilistic reasoning, if we uh, were to have a look at, for example, stock prices, we understand that stock prices themselves uh, are reflected and are, are factored into uh, a number of different factors. So, uh, if we were to represent um, the causal factors coming in, the dynamics which are actually driving uh, stock prices, uh, we would be able to uh, actually link uh, the hidden states, the hidden process which is actually driving uh, what we actually observe, uh, for example, in the FT or in the BBC News or, or in, on Bloomberg and, and as such. Now, if, if we were to represent um, the actual dynamics and what is actually going on underneath, so, so the factors that we have previously uh, been talking about, if we were to ref uh, re uh, represent them as our target density, so what we're actually interested in, uh, and then as we, as we know, you know, a priori, we don't really know exactly what this is, but we have an understanding of the dynamics which are driving this, uh, and then posit uh, uh, a prior density, a dominating density, something which covers uh, what we're actually interested in, we can then take weighted samples depending on the dynamics which we have posited, and then we're able to build uh, an estimate from these samples. Now, if we were to do this in a sequential manner, so taking in new, a, a new observation, uh, we would then be able to adaptively update uh, our understanding. So if we had um, the, these prior weights, and then we were to make a prediction based on these weights, and then we were to take in an observation, we would take in a new piece of, piece of data from, from the market, from our stream, and then we would update our understanding, and et voila, we will have a new, a new posterior distribution, new posterior density. So this is our revised belief in, in the scenario that we've just been talking about. Now, let's see a concrete example of this in, in finance. Now, in finance, uh, one of the, um, a key driver uh, and uh, a key variable which is constantly referred to is the volatility of an asset, the volatility of, for example, a stock. Now, traditionally, uh, stock price volatility has been assumed to be constant. So for a given stock price, the, the, um, the volatility uh, level of the stock has assumed to be constant. But obviously, any sort of rudimentary uh, analysis, empirical analysis, uh, you know, disproves this, uh, this notion. So if we were to assume uh, and, and understand that we cannot directly observe uh, nor predict uh, and, um, and that uh, volatility itself uh, must be treated as a random variable, then we, we, we propose modeling a, a stochastic volatility. We propose modeling a, a general randomness within volatility itself. Now, if we were to, to take in observations, so, so in, in this example here, uh, the observations are the, uh, are the, is the blue line and the hidden process, so the process which is actually driving what we see um, uh, out, again, back on in the FT or in BBC News as being, um, as being the red. Now, if we were then to apply you know, uh, uh, Bayesian methods in a recursive online fashion to try to understand what the dynamics and what is actually going on at the back, uh, we are then able to, to then lock onto the hidden process. So as, as you can quite clearly see here. 
This is a simulation. Let's do this in real life. This is General Electric, uh, so GE, uh, the AAAs of the AAAs, uh, a big stock over in the US. Um, so we're, here we have uh, their stock price from the beginning of 2010 till the end of 2012. Now, from uh, the stock price, we calibrate their daily returns, so how much they've, they've gained or lost uh, on a given day. Then we obviously we build the stochastic volatility model on top of this to try to understand uh, the latent process, the hidden process, which is actually driving what we see. And then we run our estimators. Pretty hard to see because of the accuracy. Here's a bit of a zoom to see what is actually going on. In here, you can clearly see the adaptive nature of the Bayesian estimators, which are, which are fluctuating as the, uh, the hidden signal itself is fluctuating. So they're jumping around trying to lock on to exactly what is going on underneath. And then if you were to use this as inference, you would be able to then infer back the returns and then subsequently what is actually going on in the market. And a voila, you would be able to trade this. So from finance, let's go over into astrophysics. Now, astrophysics is, uh, is, is a, a fairly, fairly large field. It's uh, concerned with uh, the nature and the dynamics of space. Now, uh, this is uh, Centaurus A. It's an active galax a galaxy nucleus, um, you know, essentially showing the power of a supermassive black hole. Now, if you see um, the X-ray jet in the top left corner just over there. Um, that I itself is, um, is 13,000 light years across, and it's, it's traveling, this, uh, the speed of, um, of the jet itself is half the speed of light. Now, can we reason and understand such complex and chaotic systems? Well, um, you know, I was uh, fortunate enough to be invited over to Harvard to apply some of uh, these methods that I've been developing here um, into uh, trying to reason and understand the dynamics of, of such, uh, such phenomena. So uh, I was interested in, in having a look at um, uh, a satellite galaxy to, to us here in the Milky Way. And um, then I, I modeled um, uh, a piece of the spectrum, a piece of, of the wavelength, uh, which is the B-band data, which you see uh, noted on, on the side. And then what we did was, uh, because obviously the data which was being given to us was very noisy, there were, there were plenty of gaps. So what we did was we then regularized the data, made sure that the, that the data was nice and ready for us to then go in and analyze. And then we, we just used some uh, very simple models uh, to try to see, you know, and then we used our recursive Bayesian estimators to see, can we actually apply these sequential Monte Carlo methods uh, into understanding um, quasars, into understanding uh, astrophysical concepts. And as you can quite clearly see from, uh, from the, uh, the, the chart, we have, uh, we have accurately captured uh, the hidden, the latent dynamics driving uh, this astrophysical time series. Now working on the uh, in the um, irregular space, so we're working on the data as it's coming to us uh, from the deep sky survey, so actually with the gaps uh, maintained, we then use a, a continuous time method, and again, we are able to, to, to model this and to be able to understand posit and understand uh, dynamics uh, of astrophysical time series. Now, um, one of the, the, the key features, um, the, actually the key outcomes of the work that we have done is by using these Bayesian methods, we have been able to, uh, we have enabled the data to speak to us and to tell us what is actually hiding, what, what the actual characteristics are. And uh, you know, interestingly enough, uh, we have uh, found uh, traces, we have found very strong uh, evidence uh, toward, uh, which indicates towards a unified, um, unified structure amongst uh, quasars, which was something, uh, you know, which is something um, contrary to literature and uh, which we've had a, a very nice time of, of actually playing with and discussing uh, with colleagues uh, both uh, in the US and here in the UK. Now, um, the, the whole idea here, again, um, was to, to, to see, can we use uh, methods away from uh, orthodox st statistics to try to infer and understand uh, the, the world around us? And as, of, uh, and as of we, we've seen, that Bayesian uh, estimation and Bayesian reasoning uh, provides us a richer language to understand the world around us. Now, I, I'm sure this is, this is quite radical uh, thinking you know, to, to, to most of you, uh, but what we've got to remember is that we all did think that the, world, that the Earth was flat once. Thank you.